Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome. We're going to get started in about 60 seconds. Just give folks a chance to get in here. Thank you so much for joining us. Super excited to have everybody back. If it's your first time, welcome to the Baselane webinar about taxes. It's the hot topic of the month. Okay. Wow. Mike, I think you're definitely going to be breaking some records today because uh, most registrations and probably the most people in in the first five seconds. <laughs> oh my gosh! Wow, I'm not I'm not nervous at all. I'm totally lying. I'm I'm pretty nervous. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome to the Baselane webinar. Today we're going to be talking about a few fun topics: bookkeeping, how to maximize taxes, tax deductions with Mike Kelly, who is one of our partners at Baselane and a CPA. And uh, I'm gonna just quickly introduce Mike. So as I mentioned, Mike is a certified public accountant. He's also a YouTube personality. He's got an amazing channel that I was following and that's how we met because we, we liked his channel. Mike uh, Mike's goals are to assist individuals, small businesses and investors in growing and protecting their wealth in a drastically evolving financial climate. Mike brings over 15 years of experience to the table here and has worked with hundreds of clients um, at major accounting firms, as well as smaller, you know, real estate investors and individuals across the country. And uh, we are very, very happy to have you here, Mike. Welcome to the Baseline webinar. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited for this one. And uh, as you know, I'm also a former CPA, no longer have my license. But uh, things have changed since I was a CPA. There's a lot more um, going on these days. So looking forward to learning about that. So today's agenda, just to quickly go through that, we're going to do a quick overview of Baselane for everybody who's new to Baselane. So you get to learn a little bit about, about that. We're going to learn about Mike's story and his area of expertise. Then we'll get into a little bit of, you know, what are the some tips to give you some concrete things to do coming out of this webinar to be able to track your finances the right way and to maximize your deductions. And then we're going to pick Mike's brain about tax credits and how to get more money back in our pocket from the IRS and uh, we'll talk a little bit then about, you know, how we can get in touch with Mike as well. So that's the agenda. And uh, let me go ahead and share my slides here um, with, with all of you to just do a quick overview of Baselane for everybody who is new to Baselane. Eric, can you can you see the screen here, Mike? Is that with the presentation? Looks, looks good. Yep, I, I can see it just fine. Awesome. Okay, so uh, we're going to have a special link today. So anybody who's watching the video on YouTube and other platforms, if you go to baseline.com slash Mike CPA, as well as on his YouTube channel, there's going to be some content about us there as well. And you follow that link, you'll be able to win a raffle contest for a $500 Amazon gift card. So definitely go through that link, baseline.com slash Mike CPA. We'll share that again. That's Mike's channel. I'm putting it right up front in case you were wondering uh, about that. And we'll share, we'll share that as a follow-up to all of the things that we're doing here as well. I already talked about the agenda. So one of the things we all often like to say is that what we saw was as baseline, most financial services today are not built for real estate investors. And what right. that means is you're really being forced into ma managing probably 10 to 15 relationships just to even run one rental property, right? And what that leads to is unclear picture of your finances, really what we don't want, which is lost income, maybe tax savings that you could have had that you didn't get and optim unoptimized spending. In addition to all that, we're all super busy with day jobs and all of that. So you don't want to be spending all this time doing this stuff, but you end up spending countless hours. I cannot tell you how many people have said, you know, how frustrated they get just reconciling things. And then eventually you don't really have a complete picture of what's going on of your finances with your business. So you're making poor decisions. So that's kind of like what we see uh, when we talk about some of these talk topics related to bookkeeping and taxes. And so what Baseline provides is really an all-in-one platform to help you organize your rental property business through a banking product that really organizes things for you through the virtual accounts and cards, through the bookkeeping, which helps you automate some of those things, but really give you like a very easy interface to allow you to keep all the books, to, to analyze your performance on an ongoing basis, and to give a tax package so you can give it to folks like Mike when they're doing tax filings to implement that strategy, but also really to use it in a way that doesn't cost you guys more money and allows you to get you know the maximum tax deduction. There's a lot more in here with baseline with property management like rent collection, but today we're going to focus on the bookkeeping, tax, and tax strategies. And so uh, one of the things Mike's going to be talking about is 
well, how do you maximize deductions? When we get to like, oh, what are the top tax credits? How do you actually maximize deductions? What should people be doing? And Mike, that's my first question to you, which is, you know, if we are starting out, if we're just a couple of properties in, what are some common things you're seeing people are not doing that they should be doing? And what are some things that, you know, you recommend people to do to get everything organized the right way? Yeah, so as simple as that might sound, you might be surprised, but I've been, like you mentioned, I've been doing this for about 15 years now. What I find if people are trying to pull together their records, whether it's on paper or in Excel, I mean, it's okay, but uh, once you get into a rental properties or trying to run a business, you, I really do feel like they need a better solution to keep track of everything. And so what's happening is if they're trying to organize everything in Excel or on a piece of paper, over time, as the volume of those transactions increases, they actually start to forget what they spent so that they'll find additional, if we were to link it to a bank feed, something like that, like, you know, baseline could do, it, it would automatically start to, um, you would have to go through it line by line by line. And there would be things in there that you might not catch if you were just trying to do this by hand or not following a more set process. And so I've, I've seen uh, work with taxpayers who, they initially gave me their records and uh, on the surface, it looked like they were going to owe like between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars. But then right. we did, did some bookkeeping and actually got their their, their bank, bank accounts reconciled and everything. And after doing that, they were shocked that they they had forgotten so many things to, to record and count as a deductible expense. And so at the end of the day, they actually got a refund in like this one example of fifteen hundred dollars. So they there's a huge swing from one way to the other. So just the just the having a good process and a good program or software, the, especially if you're getting more and more involved in rentals, I, I really do feel like it's crucial. Yeah. So on that, um, in terms of like, you know, I'll, I'll ask from a few different perspectives and everybody who's kind of participating, feel free to start ad adding your questions. We're going to uh, use those questions to ask Mike, you know, and lead the discussion that way. So go ahead and start asking your questions. One thing that we did want to launch um, as we're doing this is just a getting to know you poll. So now that we have most people in, we have over a uh, hundred and it looks like 18 people are already on. And so if you can wow. all do me a favor, I'm going to launch a poll right now. And uh, this just helps us understand who you are and how we can best help you. So how many rental properties do you currently own? That's the first question. The second question is what types of rentals are in your portfolio, midterm, short-term, long-term, et cetera. You can select many options. How confident are you in your tax return this year? Do you feel like you got it right? Do you feel like you missed missed and left some money on the table, right? Like, let us know that. So let's get that poll going and uh, we'll get that to Mike. Mike, I guess related to that, um, how are you seeing folks kind of interacting with you? Like, uh, are they coming in already organized? Uh, or like by the time they meet, you have to kind of go back and forth a little bit with with folks say, hey, look, you need to like go back and prepare your financial statements uh, to implement the tax strategy. There's a mix of both, especially, you know, I think I think people who've been having rentals for many years, they're a little bit more accustomed to what I'm used to seeing now, or I can help coach them of what what I need to see. But for the most part, people will give me records on paper or Excel, and it's okay. But what I find is that if I, when I start asking questions, there's often things they forgot to add to that. So I, I try to do a really good job to make sure I'm asking the right questions, especially if I'm seeing things on the tax form that I really think should be there, but they just forgotten to put it there. So it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a mix, mix of both. Some people are very organized, but I would say most people are not as, not as organized as I, you know, as I would like them to be, unfortunately. Yeah. Understood. And we'll get into the, why that's so important. So just a quick for you on the poll. So most uh, looks like about 47% of people have one rental property, 18% have two, 12% have three, 15% have four to 10 and about seven to 8% have more than 11. And so 11 plus. And in terms of the strategy, mostly it looks like almost 90% are midterm or long-term about 16% are also doing short-term, 4% fix and flip, 18% owner-occupied or multifamily, and 2% commercial. So the vast majority are in the long-term, mid-term bucket, and then there's about 15% that are short-term. And then in terms of how confident are you in your tax return this year, 15% of folks said they're very confident I'm getting the best return possible. 60% said somewhat confident I'm worried there are deductions and credits I'm missing. And then 25%, a quarter of the folks said, 
they're not confident, they're not really sure, and they feel like they might be paying too much and not getting enough back, for example. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an idea of who is in the audience today. And so from that perspective, um, you know, just going back to this, I think talking a little bit more about this, Mike, how do you interact with people like in these steps? Like, where do you fit into this picture? Yeah, so I come in when I initially start my process with a client, I typically will usually ask for a prior year return. And that prior year return might have some rental activity on it, or it might not. It might be their first year with a rental. But my first goal is to help coach them and guide them of what type of things I need to see and what kind of um, questions I, you know, go through the questions of seeing how involved are they in running their rental, managing their rental, things like that. Do they have a property manager doing this? Most of my clients I work with, I'll just tell you, have uh, anywhere from between one to 20 rentals. That's the typical size right. of client. Um, right. big, biggest real estate client I ever worked with was at one of my previous firms I used to work at, um, had over a hundred million dollars in real estate. So that's where I got really comfortable working um, with with the average, you know, I don't have to, I don't work with the, the mega rich anymore. Now I'm working more so with, you know, the everyday investor, which I really enjoy a lot more. Got it. That's helpful. And uh, I think we're going to transition into the next topic, but uh, yeah, like I think just following some of these processes, I know Mike, I'm actually connecting with you too for my, my, my rental uh, business. So definitely uh, my focus just for the audience is going to be, I've already done this. Like I've organized my finances for baseline already with different virtual accounts and cards with my Airbnb and regular properties. I use the bookkeeping software. Uh, one of my things that I'm doing is connecting with Mike on, hey, do I have the right tax strategy? If I'm buying some properties, if I'm selling some properties, if I'm getting it to midterm, what should I be doing? And obviously, you know, you want to keep, make sure you do the bookkeeping. So one thing that we wanted to highlight is, before we get into tax credits, is just some common tax deductions. We're, we, we're not going to read all of these out to you. All of these can be tracked on base lane and all the categories exist there. But uh, we did want to take a few minutes with Mike and talk through this and, and see like, what are some of the opportunity areas you see where people might be under leveraging the deductions, not the credits, but the deductions when we talk about the everyday investor? Yeah. So on just on that list, I think a great one on there is startup costs. So a lot of investors don't realize that as you're in the process of looking for a property to to acquire, uh, there's a, you're going to incur some costs. So it's very. I always tell my clients who are looking to acquire a new property, you know, if you're if you're traveling around trying to view new property properties, um, or you need to like travel out of state to go look at a property outside of like for like because I'm in California, for example. So a lot of my clients they're actually purchasing properties in like the Midwest, as an example. And so I have them track all those costs because if they end up executing on a property you know, we may be able to deduct a good portion of those costs and they they never realize it until speaking with me. Gotcha. That's important. And that's, you know, there was a question on a on a mastermind training that I was doing a few days ago. Hey, I just started investing. I, I don't even have a property yet. Why should I be opening up like a separate bank account and starting to do the bookkeeping? And that was also my advice, which was like, hey, like, because you're going to be spending money on the business. So you should start tracking that expense uh, in, in a place like a, like basically platform or bookkeeping, um, anything else that stands out to you on this list are, uh, for example, I, I was, I'm assuming we'll get into depreciation a little bit, but anything else that you see folks that are missing out or not maybe optimizing in the expenses typically? Yeah. So definitely on the, sometimes, you know, the, I actually, well, on the depreciation, actually, I have I have found come across several returns where depreciation was not properly calculated, hmm. and so a lot of times they don't. Uh, a client I'm working with might not realize. Maybe they had like a previous preparer before, but I I, I like to see the actual purchase document when when they purchased that you know home that that you know when they when they actually bought it the the big the big long document from escrow that says all of the all of the fees they paid because a lot of those fees like commissions and title charges. Uh, can actually be depreciated over the cost of the property. And I think right. that gets missed quite a bit. Yeah, that's really, that's a good one. And, uh, you know, like even part of like when you're closing, right, the closing costs and like portions of that can be, depending on what it is, can be deducted, for example. And uh, I'm going to just read some questions here that are maybe related to this topic. So we can go through that now as we're kind of um, sure. discussing these things. Um is there a best way to find all the things to categorize and track for rentals? 
from Brittany. Yeah, Brittany, so that is possible. We have some blog content on our page as well. I think Mike's probably YouTube channel covers it, but uh, we can send something out on that. And uh, in terms of like the categories themselves, if you go into like the base lane bookkeeping section and do the drop down, you're going to see all the different options for income expenses and, and non-income related categories there as well. So uh, I don't know if that, that answers your question. Mike, do you have any resources on your side that provide people with a list of the common deductions or categories? So I think the way you found me actually was I have a free rental spreadsheet. It's just Excel. It's nothing, it's nothing right. nearly as comprehensive as, as baseline. I and mean, clearly your, your program is much better in the long run for, for people to use, especially if they want to grow their rental business. And just, it say, it does save them a lot of time at, you know, the more transactions they take on, but um, that spreadsheet has a lot of just common expenses listed in there. So it's just a good memory jogger. It's not like the greatest tool, but it's free, but um, yeah. And That's I think, all. I yeah. think a, another thing as we're talking about expenses that, you know, I, I don't see on here is a good one is, is, oh, I guess it is up there in mileage is, is, is your miles. So a lot of, a lot of investors, they don't track their miles, but if you are somebody who's pretty active and going to, you know, let's say once a quarter, you have a, you have one tenant in your property, you have one property, you have one tenant. Once a quarter, you drive over to that property, you do a walkthrough, those kind of things. You know, just check on the property, check right. on the tenant. All of um, that is, yeah, all that should be tracked. Make sure you're, make sure you're tracking that. You know, we may or may not be able to use it, but because you've tracked it, we actually, we might be able to. So if, if I can find my clients more deductions, as long as you have the records to prove it, I'm, you know, I'm comfortable moving that direction, you know, as long as it makes sense. That's helpful. What about office uh, deductions? Like a lot of people are working from home these days too. And I'm assuming they, they do a lot of their, you know, real estate management related work um, from their home. How do you typically uh, bring that into like the tax deductions? It's a little tougher if it's a, so it, that's a great question, but it really depends on if they actually have like a separate property management business. That's more so where as the schedule E, when you're looking at the tax forms is more so for like a real estate investor per se. Um, so if you have like a, an active business where, yeah. where that you're not, you're not passive in it, you are very, you spend like hundreds of hours in it per year, then, then that we can look at an unlocking those kind of deductions. So like we look at the square footage of the room you're using within your, within your home for business. And we could look at deducting a portion of your utilities, property taxes, mortgage interest, all of these things that most people cannot deduct anymore because that um, the, the standard deduction now is so high. Most people are no longer itemizing at all. You're able to bypass that as a business owner and at least take part of it. Maybe not all of it, but at least part of it as an extra uh, deduction. That's a good tip. Does that mean when you do tax strategy, I'm kind of reading between the lines, I should be setting up a separate property management company if I'm the one managing the property? Yeah, my, my largest real there. estate clients I've interacted with, they all have, they event, they eventually do set up their own property management company. Because when you, most, I'll, I'll say this. So like most people I found, they they start off with one property. They usually have a full-time job, maybe, maybe um, you know, married couple, both working. Um, and maybe they, they can't do as much of that because they're working. But perhaps if we, if the, if thinking long-term, we can develop a strategy so that if you would like to, move more that direction, we can find ways to unlock more and more deductions. And it's because it, it's not just about like spending money in certain areas. It's more than that. It's actually kind of changing your lifestyle and the way you make a living to really maximize on all that uh, side mm -hmm. of tax deductions. That's helpful. Uh, meaning like there's a lifestyle change. There's a way the, the way the business being managed changes, but also you get tax deductions. From exactly. It. Yeah. So it's really, yeah, I, I mean, I can tell you, well, go, go spend some money over here, or over there, and you can get a deduction, but I can get you a much better deduction if you actually start to walk the walk of a business owner. That's super helpful. I love that, 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 that mental shift into running this business. There's a couple of other questions that related to these deductions that I'll read out. So uh, Jonathan's asking, uh, related to depreciation, I know you can write off depreciation of a home. We lived in our home for four years before renting it out. Do I still have to do the one over 27th uh, or whatever of its value uh, depreciation? Can I deduct it in a better way? I think he's talking about the straight line depreciation. Yeah. Yeah. Was, you said it was dealing with Jonathan? Yes. Yeah. Jonathan, you know, you're pretty you're pretty much spot on. So yeah, that's the, the standard way to deduct real estate is the straight line method. And it's over, 
the you get the so we have to split if we buy a the home land. we have yeah. to do, do some sort of split between the value of the land and the value of the dwelling we can't depreciate the land it's always it's not depreciable right. but we can depreciate the value of the dwelling so let's say you buy a home for 500,000 and let's say the value of the land is 100,000 and then we can depreciate the 400,000 as the dwelling portion we typically have to expense this over 27 and a half years however if now you might have heard of cost segregation studies those are becoming more and more popular there is a way to accelerate depreciation on certain types of property but we i would say before you go spend the money to do a study like that which might cost you a couple thousand dollars speak to somebody like me let's make sure you can actually benefit from that accelerated depreciation before you go and spend that money right i think there is a threshold of the property type and the value right where it makes more sense yeah what's in the home as well like the things that are inside the house the flooring and all of those things uh so that's a that's a good tip uh, there's another question can months of vacancy be tax deductible lost rent so if the property i'm assuming is available to be rented but it's be it, let's say it's been vacant for three months out of the year can the expenses related to that property utilities mortgage are those deductible yeah great question so, I mean, if if you have it available for rent, but it's not being rented, it still counts as like a rental, like a uh, on the schedule, you, on schedule E, you'll see it's asking how many days was this available for rent or fair rental days. So as long as it is available for rent, whether or not somebody is renting it doesn't matter. You're trying to get it rented. Um, so it's still an active rental basically because you're trying to rent it out. Now, in terms of if somebody was paying you $500 a month or $1,000 a month to rent it, and now they're no longer paying you that because they've moved out or whatever this case may be. You can't deduct $500 a month um, off that because it's just, you just can't. But at least every other expense like you're incurring on that property, the mortgage, util or not the mortgage, but the interest you pay, the um, utilities, right. taxes, all that, you can still deduct all that. Gotcha. Uh, that's helpful. Uh, there's a couple of cost side questions. I'll come back to this. I think it gets into the tax credit world a little bit too. So, We'll come back to that one. There was one related to professional fees. Can you claim real estate license training and application fees as a deduction? The, um, that's you know it's kind of a, that's kind of a gray area. I think in some instances you can, and I think if you're a real estate professional, it's it's a little bit easier to do that and justify that. But if you're not somebody who is a real estate professional, then mm, it's kind of it's kind of a gray area to be honest. Right. Unless you're assuming, running, yeah. yeah. Does that depend on what the reason is, right? Like if you're saying oh, I'm about to start a property management company, like we talked about, and you know what, I'm also getting my license related to that. Uh, wouldn't that kind of fit into the the business expense for that type of a endeavor? Yeah, exactly. I, I feel like that's more of a business expense kind of thing versus a rental investment kind of thing, if that makes sense. I see. Like if you're only an investor and you're trying to get the license, yeah, you'd have to figure out how to justify that um, as yeah. well. Yeah, I'm not um, saying you couldn't do it, but it's it's there's there, there's no there's no black and white that says you can you can do it. It's it's a gray area. <laughs> it's it's probably something you'd want to talk about with your your CPA. Yeah, helpful. Um, okay, there's a few more questions in here. I'll just cover related to base lane. So, can you link business business credit card to base lane for bookkeeping? You can. You can link any type of external account like your checking accounts, credit cards, debit cards. Uh, through a tool called Plaid and import all of those transactions up to about, I think, two years if they're in your account that pull, pull into our bookkeeping software. So that's possible. Now, uh, there is a question about organization here. So do you recommend, you know, we talk about organizing the right way. Do you recommend that investors keep the different types of rentals they have separate in terms of like maybe, I, I think maybe Brittany, you're, is that, are you talking about bank accounts or are you talking about uh, something else when you say separation? Can you clarify that, Brittany, please? Let's see if we'll get that clarified. Assuming, uh, assuming you're talking about bank accounts, so does that help with people uh, bringing like different rental strategy books to you? Like this is my midterm, this is my short term, or are you, Mike, more concerned about it more at the property level in terms of like the tax filings? Great question. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate that question, actually, because I really, for me personally, in my experience, I find that it is easiest if things are broken down by property, generally speaking, not um, whether or not it's midterm or long term, 
that's fine if it is or not, it or isn't, but just having that breakdown by property is probably for me, the most beneficial thing to look at, because as long as I know what those numbers are for that property, then we can decide how we can treat that property. Gotcha. That's helpful. And yeah, there's another question related to Robert. Thanks for clarifying your question related to the uh, education. So if I'm a real estate investor and I'm going to a conference, I'm going to buy some books. Like for example, I, I bought like a 30 day rental the other day, Sarah Weaver reading that book right now. Can how can I deduct that against my real estate uh, income? I think it I think it more so depends on if you are are you in the business of real estate? Um, are you becoming a real estate professional? I think that's more going towards that way versus just having maybe just oh, one rental for the moment. Because uh, because oftentimes our education is not deductible in most cases, unfortunately. Okay, um, so most cases like on a W two, if you have standard deduction probably not going to be applicable, right? Because you're not- Probably I, not. Probably yeah. not, to be honest. But right. I mean, if you're going to, let's say you're going through a college program and you're you're, you're trying to obtain a degree, whether it's a bachelor's or master's, and you're doing something related to real estate, now that's a little bit different. The, we, we might have some options there. Right. Um, well, how about this? Like I have an LLC, right? And it's a it's all, the whole purpose of the LLC is to invest in rental properties. You employ the birth strategy- so uh, when we invest in like going to a conference, for example, as a way to learn about how to, you know, be a better rental property owner, is that still in the gray area or that does that is that more explicit? That um, it, it depends on we'd have to find the nature of, of the reason you went and the nature of that. I, I think it's still a little bit of a gray area, but I think upon some further digging and analysis, we might be able to find ways to take that, especially if you have an LLC. I think it. I think the more you lead towards showing that you're a business owner and demonstrating that you're a business owner, the more likely that's not going to be a flag expense. That's helpful. Yeah, that's helpful. Robert, uh, hopefully that uh, answers your question. And uh, I'm going to uh, maybe take one or two more before we get to the next section here. Uh, let's see. And uh, Jake, I might need your help on this too. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, uh, again, Zig Cohort says, can you clarify, this might be a good segue, can you clarify tax credit versus deduction against income versus against tax liability? So what's the difference between deductions and tax credits? Great question, Lisa. And I, uh, how do we think about that? Like, does it, does it go against your W-2 income or does it first go against your rental income and then eventually W-2? I love this question because I actually have a video, one of my older videos now, but I actually have a video on that as I think it's called, I think I called it tax credit versus tax deduction or, or something like that. I made it years ago, but th this is the way to think about it. So on your tax return, all of your income is going to go into one bucket. All of the money you make from wages, interest, dividends, real estate, whatever income sources you have, right? You're going to arrive at a taxable income amount. That taxable income amount is going to generate, you know, a certain amount of tax. So let's say, Let's say you add up all your income and based on that income, that means you're going to owe federal taxes of $10,000, right? So how do deductions and credits affect that $10,000 tax liability? So a deduction is not as good as a credit. So let me explain. So um, you probably have heard of tax brackets. So most people I work with are in the 12%, 22%, or 24% bracket. And I have a few clients who make over a million a year, but most people are between 12 and 24%. So okay. on a federal tax level, if you were to spend $1 to get a deduction, that $1 deduction is going, and your tax rate is 22%, that $1 is going to save you, that $1 expense you make is going to save you 22 cents in taxes. Right. So you, so you only get a as a deduction, you only get a percentage written off of your taxes based on the tax bracket you're in. A credit, the reason it's so much better is if you can get a credit, you actually can deduct dollar for dollar. Right. Instead of just going based on your income bracket. So it's a much better, it's a much better uh, way to to save on taxes. Yeah. So this is where tax credit becomes uh very interesting. And the strategy for how do you get more tax credits becomes more interesting. So maybe we can shift into that a little bit. And I have a feeling we have a long Q&A here <laughs> based on all the questions that are coming. So maybe, Mike, we can talk a little bit about, you know, tax uh, credits. And so one way, I mean, I, I don't expect a full consultation here for me, but one way I thought about it was like, look, uh, you know, we see that a lot of people are investing in long-term 
or midterm rentals. Most people had, it seemed like one to four properties, some have more. If you're in that situation, you have a W-2 and you have a couple of rental properties and I want to know, okay, what are the tax strategies I can start implementing uh, while I work with you, for example, to develop that strategy? What are some you know areas that you'd want to uh, that person to focus on? Uh, you mean credit wise or just in general? Just like tax, I've been talking about tax credits, but okay. I'm assuming you might want to understand a little bit more about the business before you get into all that. Yeah. Yeah. So my goal is when I work with each of my clients is to determine kind of where, when they first come to me, let's determine where they're at, kind of see, compile everything and say, okay, this is our starting line. And then talk about, okay, well, where are you trying to go? That's some people, they, they don't really want to try to own multiple rentals. They don't, they don't want to really change things that much. They don't care. They're, right. they're happy with what they have. Other people though, they're really looking for more strategy. They're trying to figure out how they can best position themselves to grow this as a wealth building strategy because real estate is one of the most powerful ways to do that. And so my goal is to work with each client and determine um, how we can shape a plan for them to become more active in their real estate in terms okay. of, how they, you know, whether it, well, going back to courses and classes, yeah. whether it's going back to them, you know, doing more property management themselves or, you know, screening tenants more or be the one who collects the rent or, you know, oh, Airbnb is a good example because, you know, maybe they go clean the property, you know, maybe they're the ones who are cleaning the property or, you know, taking out the trash or all that. Right. So um, if I can help them become a more active investor, I can change the way those deductions benefit them. And I see. So, and so we're talking about the two concepts I'm really getting at here is active investor versus passive investor. Right. An active, the, the client I worked on who had a hundred million dollars in real estate, he was an active investor. He got, when he had a loss on paper on his real estate, even though he technically made a lot of money, he could actually take that loss and write it off against all of his wages and everything else he made. Whereas right. the average person can, cannot do that. So, but, so, but they have to learn to position themselves so that they eventually can. I see. So let me just summarize this because I think it gets a little complicated. Um, and so basically what you're saying is most of us on this call, on this webinar are probably passive investors, right? Right. If you're a passive investor and you end up in a loss situation, let's say you say, you know what, based on the numbers and de depreciation, whatever you do, I'm losing $5,000. Now you can't take that 5K and go over to your W2 income. Let's say you made 100K and say, okay, 100K minus 5K. So I only taxes on the 95, right? Right, yeah, I can't do that. Can't do that. There's different ways of treating the loss, but you can't do the loss. But you're saying if there's an active status to my, my business, and if I'm an active real estate um, investor, then I can't apply such a loss or a bigger loss to the income that I that I have to offset it directly. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So what you do with people is uh, the way you strategize is figuring out if there's a way for them to become active and not passive. Yeah. And, you know, I had a conversation the other day with a gentleman. We did a consultation. I spent probably like an hour and a half with him. And and he's in, a, in a, currently in his the point of life he's in, he's working full time. You know, he he can't change that anytime soon. But um, for 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 those who really can't change their job status right now, right? Um, maybe down, maybe it's a couple of years down the line. So the next thing I look at is okay. Well, let's look at your overall income. Can we right. get start to get your overall income down below one hundred and fifty thousand? So there's a unique rule that mm. if you if we can get your income. So even if you're not super active in real estate, even if you're not doing it full time or, you know, right. hundreds of hours a year, even if you just do it like a hundred, just a hundred hours, just a hundred. Um, and you can document that of like what you did to manage your property, whether it's one or multiple, if we can get you down to about a hundred thousand between a hundred and 150,000, if you do have a loss in your rental, which most people on paper, they show a loss, then there's a special rule that will allow you to deduct up to $25,000 of that loss against mm. your against your other income, like your wages or interest or dividends or whatever else it is. Very interesting. So, okay, so understood. So I think there was a question from one gentleman about that limit. So the limit, just for everybody's clarity, is if if you are active, just to make sure I understand, and you're above the 150, it's not going to apply, right? So what you're saying is, uh, to make sure I got that right, you have to be below 150, for it to apply, even if you're active. Did I get that right? 
Sort of, yeah. You were close. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So if you're, I'm just replaying it so everybody gets it too. So I'm glad I, I asked. If yeah. you're, if you're, if you're very active, or like you're a real estate professional, yeah. Then, then the, the income limit doesn't really apply. But if you're not very active, but if you can just show, demonstrate that you've participated in your rental activity by managing it the hundred hours in a year, okay, th that's just enough. And then, if, and then if we can figure out strategically through tax planning how to get if if, if we can keep it below one fifty. And even get it okay. closer to to a hundred thousand. If we can do that, that's even right. better because now those losses are going to be able to be taken during the current year against your wage income and your other okay. income sources. I know this is complicated, so we're, we're probably going to have to chat after this. But I want to just yeah. so I'm not active, meaning I'm not. I don't have the five hundred hours, but I have the hundred hours. Hundred hours below one hundred and fifty, good. Yep. That's that yep. you in the game. And if you're in the five hundred hour category, the uh, the income limit doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, but right. it starts to matter less and less. Yep. Starts to matter less and less. But you have to figure out there's an excellent question here from Gina. How do you get this 500 hours? Like what counts as 500 within the 500 hours versus not? I'm assuming there's a lot of maybe some uh, vagueness to that too. Yeah. So the IRS, uh, if you go to the IRS website and look up like material participation um, and, and material right. participation test, it's very complex and they don't, and unfortunately they do not spell out exactly what meets those hours. They, they don't give us the keys to the castle, unfortunately, but um, yeah. I can tell you this though. So like if, if you're just like researching or looking at finances of your property or, or researching an investment that doesn't count. So the act, the hours really are more so managing it, managing. Dealing, dealing it with tenants. You don't have to do the repairs yourself, but repairs is a good one. If you are doing it yourself, it really helps. Cause then that, that is you directly involved in fixing up that property. So that really helps. Um, and just like collecting checks, dealing with tenants, coordinating repairs, coordinating management. So there's a lot of things that do count, but um, but yeah, and if it's just one property, it is hard to get to that level unless you're really, really cleaning it right. a lot or mowing the lawn. Some people mow their own lawns on the properties. I know a few of my investors do that and they're very right. active in their properties and they own maybe like, and they probably own like four or five properties. Right. So Mike, let me ask you this. Like, let's say I only have a couple of properties. I don't, I don't think I'm going to hit that. Right. Like, is it still relevant for me to come talk to you and maybe sit down and plan this out for the next couple of years and say, Hey, how do I get to that level on the income side, but also as I get more properties to be ready to go so I can start having those, you know, tax credits, uh, reducing my income. Absolutely. Cause even if you can't deduct, like if you have a rental loss and even if you can't deduct it in the current year, we can still set up a long-term strategy for you so that um, as you look to acquire more properties, we're optimizing your tax efficiency the whole way through. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah. Uh, that's super, super helpful. Yeah, I think there's a lot of questions related to this where folks are saying, look, I've got a W-2 income and you know, I've got a couple of properties I can't figure out how to maximize more of it. And so that so the active passive classification is important, but also how you can potentially lower your your adjusted gross income i'm guessing right yep yep trying to lower the agi as much as the agi yeah. as much as possible and we want to be practical about it too we don't you know if if you had to try to lower your agi by fifty thousand, uh, it's probably a bit much it's it's maybe not worth it you know what i mean i would never right. i never tell my clients spend to spend a dollar to save a quarter it's just not worth it but if if you are in a sweet spot where you're close then that probably makes sense to look at some strategies to get you get you below that level that's helpful. And so uh, another question that's I think relevant to this uh, discussion is the, we talked about active passive. Now within the active passive conversation or just in general related to that, does it matter if you're a sole proprietor or an LLC? Does that have a major tax uh, benefit or does that harm you in any way? Love the question. I think uh, because of, I don't know if it's because of YouTube or TikTok or whatnot, but I get a lot of confusion around um, having the property in the LLC versus not. So there's a lot of people you'll see on social media, they'll say, oh, you got to put your property in the LLC. You got to do this, you got to do that. Um, that may or may not be true. So I think if you were to acquire several properties, I would definitely say, yeah, you probably should get an LLC around that. But in terms, is it going to save you a ton in tax? It's really not. It Honestly, it's just not because the rules are basically the same. Right, uh, pass through. Yeah, it's a pass through. It's still going to be treated the same way for the most part. But then you might find yourself like, okay, well, now I have to, you know, maybe if you're doing this with a couple other people, now you have a multi-member LLC filing. So that's a separate business expense, which uh, accounting fees you pay, by the way, are fully right. deductible or legal fees, you know, that you can deduct those. But uh, right. But 
my goal is to help my clients operate as cheaply as possible until they're ready, until they feel like they're ready to take that next leap up into another entity type. Right. Got it. And yeah, the LLC is really there for that legal protection. Yeah. Yeah. And technically it's a pass through. So it's coming into your personal 1040 anyway. Uh, so that's a, that's a great question. Thank you for that question. Um, there's another question from Michael. Uh, we talked about the 150 limit to not, you know, lower it. Can you lower that by investing more into your 401k or uh, your IRA or something like that? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a wonderful question. Yeah, there are great ways to lower it. Um, I think for the average W-2 wage earner, earner is definitely 401k. If you can do like a health savings account, health savings accounts, if you if you if your insurance plan allows you to have one of those, it's so nice. I would recommend that you max that out every year. All those things are gonna help lower your AGI. And it's just it's just a win-win. And yeah, like, that's, the, that's a smart that's a smart move. And uh is there like a sort of a checks and balances in this like like if you have a W-2 job, you're working a nine to five, let's say, and now you're expected to hit the 500 hours, for example, like it, is that, does, do you see people doing it where they can do the W-2 job? I'm just doing a reality check and doing the 500 hours with IRS immediately say, well, no red flag, this guy, there's no way he put in 500 hours to manage these three properties. So let me give you my, just, uh, it's just really an opinion, right? On the, on yeah. this. Uh, so all the years I've been doing this, there are there have been several court cases in the past where the IRS has challenged people with full time jobs to say, well, you, there's no way you're a real estate professional. You're there's no way you can do both of these. Um, there's a few. A lot, oftentimes, the people will the taxpayer will lose, but there have been court cases where they win, and the win they win is because they have substantiation, and that substantiation is they actually have a written hour log of all the activities they did. They were able to present that in tax court, and that's why the, the tax court actually ruled over the IRS and said taxpayer wins. It's right. just having it all comes down to good record keeping at the end of the day. The most basic thing, it's the most unsexiest thing to talk about is the record keeping, but is is probably the most important thing of this. It launches everything else is that good having those good records. I see that's helpful. And when you strategize with people, uh, obviously, like I don't actually have this, but when you mentioned the hundred hour rule, I was thinking to myself, I probably spend easily more than a hundred hours all with all the stuff that I personally do for the year. Um, do you give people like that you work with your clients a way to structure that? Like, is there an Excel sheet or how do you, how do people like log, like here's what I did today, you know, so on. I think Excel is a good start or even having um, even, even like some people actually carry like a physical, like notebook. I don't like something like this, um, a simple notepad like this. That's where they, they jot down all their rental hours, the date, uh, date they worked and kind of just a really like a one or two sentence thing of what they did right um, okay. at the property that's yeah, yeah some, it, that's super helpful some questions are getting very granular guys so i'm not going to probably get to all of them so we'll cover some of these but um in terms of credits you know we've just to zoom out a little bit more um we've been talking about tax credits with mike kelly and just trying to understand like what they are and how does it help us as real estate investors are there other kind of things you recommend that we think about for tax credits that could be useful. I mean, look, uh, there's a couple of questions here about cost seg, for example, and accelerated depreciation. And uh, uh, one question is, have you done that for other clients before? Like, do you perform the cost segregation or do you consult people on doing cost segregation and, you know, accelerating depreciation? Yeah, great question. So I personally don't prepare the cost segregation. I usually would outsource that to a company to to do that for them. Um, okay. It's not it's not my background, but what I do what what I can do is I would if they're thinking about doing that, I'd I would like to talk to them about first finding out how active they are in real estate before they go and spend the money because I think it's it's usually like a like fifteen hundred to two twenty five hundred as kind of like the average cost of doing depending one of those on the things. property, right, right, and also yeah, I guess yeah. strategy also matters, right? Like, are you what are we talking about here? Are you talking about Airbnb type, STR, right, or 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 uh, long term? Is that also going to impact this this whole like evaluation? Yes. Um. So we'll talk about the property type, commercial, residential, how they're using it, all those kind of things. Um, so with, with taking, uh, like a cost segregation where you're getting accelerated appreciation, I want to make sure if they go and do that, that they can actually use it that year. So I worked I see. A, a, a good example. I just did this, um, in December, I was working with a client, her husband now does real estate full-time. So they lined up for the real estate professional hours. He, he did all the work on three properties the whole year. That's what he did. And, oh, wow. uh, 
And so they all, they also did a cost segregation on those properties on each one of them. And so we were able to, um, what they do in those cost segregations, instead of needing to expense it over 27 and a half years, like I think like Jonathan was talking about earlier, yes, they break it down into tiny little components in like a 40 or 50 page document. So it's really a fat document. So that <laughs> we have good proof yeah. of like what they looked at. They Everything have, you have in the house. Yeah. I think they find the wires. If, they, if there's a mouse in the house, they depreciate that, you know, I'm being silly, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but basically they take as much as they can to get it under a 20 year life. Cause anything under a 20 year life, like carpets, five years, flooring is uh, a cardboard floor is like seven. Um, and there's like landscaping improvements is 15 years. So there's different life. There's groups. lighting, right? All of that. Yeah. Stuff. Like Too all big. these kind of things. Yeah. So, but anything under 20 year life, you can bonus depreciation and you can expense it all in the first year. Now, the last thing I want to mention on this, the thing to remember is that um, the, the benefit of doing a cost irrigation, it, it does not give you more depreciation than you would have gotten if you hadn't done it. You just get the same amount of depreciation faster. Right. Meaning on that property, if you did it over the 27 years, the total wouldn't change because that's the value yeah. of the home based on the capital yeah. you know, improvements you made. But what we're talking about is bonus depreciation that's accelerating it from, hey, once a little bit every 20 years, 27 years to bigger chunks in the year that we're talking about. Yeah. And and the last cool thing I want to mention on that, and then I'll I'll be quiet about it, but is so then that put them in a really good position income wise because they were able to offset a lot of their wages. They then because they're getting ready for to retire and they have a lot of money sitting in, in taxable 401k accounts. Okay. We were then able to do a Roth conversion on a good amount of money. So to get as much of that money out at a oh, very amazing. low rate. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, awesome. They, so they actually chose a str they strategically chose to pay more tax, but it's smart because they're they're paying that tax overall at a lower rate versus if they waited to do it later. Got it. Got it. So with the ta the cost segregation and uh, ta the accelerated bonus appreciation, um, just to summarize, you do work with some folks that you can kind of like uh, refer to say, okay, go do a cost seg. But before you do that, you actually figure out if it makes sense for the person and uh you just rough numbers like is it gonna is it gonna be worthwhile and can they apply for that year as you mentioned yeah because otherwise what would happen is they can go to if they can't really use it that year it's yeah. going to be suspended and that loss is going to keep carrying forward from year to year until it's fully used up i see I which, see. which oh. in that case they would have gotten it anyways had they just been patient and waited to take the depreciation over the long run right and the way to figure out if they can actually use it how is that like is that how do we know that? If I earned 100K and W2, 150K, is that one of the things you're using to say, all right, can you actually use this for the year? Like you have to have earned enough to offset the... Right. We I want to look at their overall income and then not only their overall income, but also like how active they are in the property and that, you know, managing it and that kind of thing. I see. And can, can folks, uh, I think uh, Katie asked a really good question here. Can we do this anytime we want the cost seg, or is it really just upfront when you're getting it started and you want to accelerate the depreciation because you just spent all this money improving the property? That is a wonderful question. Um, you know, I'm not a, I think it's primarily done during like the early years. I think even like if you were like, like one or two years in, maybe three years, it's probably still fine. Um, no. But I think once, I think once that, you can check with a cost segregation study on that because I don't know if they would say, well, after five years, we're not going to do this. But um, I think, think you can do it anytime, but most people do it um, earlier on in the beginning of the property before there's too much depreciation taken. Okay. Got it. That's helpful. So I am going to now, we have about 10 minutes left and Mike's been very generous to answer all these questions. Thank you. And hopefully that's helping everybody here. I'm going to try to focus on some of the bigger questions that we feel are going to be helping, you know, a broader audience uh, that everybody's listening. Cause we have a lot of people on the line here, over 150 people. And so I'll focus on the last 10 minutes of this uh, webinar on that. And then we will be sharing with everybody how you can get in touch with Mike after the call. And uh, we'll send some information out about that too, just so you know, you're able to get in touch with him and ask, ask more um, and uh, you know, work with him on strategizing things. So there was, um, I'm gonna just zoom out a little bit because we were talking about rental properties. Somebody had asked a question about organization, uh, you know, and uh, security deposits. So there's a question about, should that be kept separate in a non-interest bearing account? And so it's not really a tax question. That's more of a legal question. Legal, yeah. 
this is not really legal advice, or uh, so don't take it as that. But we did write a guide on Baselane's blog. If you go to our resources section about that at the state level, and we reference the state sites where you can see what the requirements are for you and whether or not you know you have to put it in a separate account. Generally, though, most real estate investors you should be putting it in a separate account that's not operational, mm -hmm. keeping that money separate because it's not your money. Uh, generally, I'm just saying it in layman's terms. But each state has its own law, so you can check out the guide on Baseline's blog. Lisa, thank you for that question. And so uh, there are more questions about, uh, let me just see here, I'm scanning through here. Ah, this was a, a question from Greg I wanted to come back to. This is important, I think, for tax preparation. So they have, if you have properties in different states, how do you best handle the income reporting? That's the question. I'm assuming Greg is also just talking about organizing it and when you're preparing the tax returns, Mike, how do you want to, what's the ideal scenario you want to see that information in when Greg is bringing that into you? Oh, great question. Yeah. So properties in different states. I think actually the organization of that is very similar to any other property, to be honest. Um, from a tax reporting standpoint, where you pay tax on that primarily resides to where you live. So like if you, so like if I'm in California, which I am, so uh, several of my clients have properties all across the U.S., even though they live in California. Uh, and they might pay a little bit of tax and that's, if there's enough tax income generated in that state, they might have to pay a little tax on that, do, do another state filing because the property's over there. But I would say the bulk of the tax they pay on that income is actually, because they live in California, as an example, is paid with California tax. I see, I see. So really it's not, It's obviously the state matters for like state filing purposes, but like, like on baseline, you can track the property, the address level, and that address level PL is really enough for yeah. what yeah. you're what you're talking about here. That's uh that's helpful. So that's it. That thanks for that question. And I think that's a, that's a good way to there was a question about how do you break down the land value versus the, like the home value, but we're not gonna get into that unfortunately. That's very detailed. I think mm -hmm. you talk to your mic or your CPA about that because um you know that there's there's rules for that too it's it's um it's related to the purchase of the transaction and so on and so uh we'll keep going uh candace asks i set up a different bank account for different properties sorry there's a lot of thunder here i don't know if you can pick it up <laughs> but it's, it's getting yeah. creepy do i still need to have different business credit cards for different properties expenses now yeah that, that i guess not related to taxes michael do you have a any tips on that? Like if folks are setting up different basic bank accounts for different properties to keep it, you know, clean, maybe the virtual accounts, should they have different credit cards as well? Or do you, you feel like your clients usually have one credit card they manage everything through? That's a great question. Um, that's a really good question, actually. So a couple of things on that. So in terms of not even from the credit card level, but even let's just talk about the bank account level real quick from the bank account level, having a bank account for each property, or at least maybe not one for every property, but at least for all of your rental activity in one place, that really helps from an accounting standpoint, from every, every standpoint you can think of, even if you do have an LLC, a lot of people don't know this, but if you have an LLC and you say, okay, my property's in the LLC, I have legal protection. If you are actually commingling funds with a personal account, you are actually piercing the corporate veil of your LLC. So it's really important to have an LLC and a business checking account in the LLC as well, if you have an LLC. Um, gotcha. so, and so, so I, credit card, does that mean you should go and get a credit card for that LLC? Yes, right? I, I would. Credit card. I wouldn't say you have to have like five or 10 credit cards unless you really, really wanted to um, rake in all those rewards or whatever. But um, as long yeah. as you, I just say, as long as it's separate from your completely, and I mean completely separate from your personal, you keep your personal life per personal, you keep your business business. If you okay. do that, it's going to save you so much uh, time and headaches and gives you that legal protection that you probably paid for. Uh, you don't want to violate that. That's a really good point. Like, don't violate the LLC protection you're getting by commingling funds. And with basically, like, you can set up an LLC level bank account. And if you have multiple LLCs, you can have multiple bank accounts. And if you don't have an entity or if you're just one entity, you can just have virtual accounts within that at the property level. Since you only have one LLC protection, kind of, then you don't really need more than one uh, account as well. As far as credit cards go, I think sometimes I see people have multiple credit cards too. Mm -hmm. I really don't personally think you need to have it at every single property level. I think it's overkill. Yeah. Remember that slide we looked at earlier? Don't overcomplicate your life. Don't have yeah. too many things open because 
You're going to have to keep track of all of it, pay the bills. And then you have to categorize all that stuff. So I'd rather you know, keep one or two accounts or credit card accounts, pull them into base lane and tag those into the right property and expense as you go every, you know, once or, once or twice a week and keep it moving. Uh, I, love, I love that. That's what I agree 100%. Yeah, so I think we're getting close to the end here. So I do want to ask one or two more questions, but uh, there was a question from Robert and I'm actually not familiar with this. So I'll bring this up. I'm curious to learn about this topic myself. Uh, Robert says, can you comment on the new LLC BOI designation we need to do? Is that for all LLCs or do all LLC holding companies or the ones just with a property in account? I'm not familiar with this uh, BOI designation. Actually, just on my channel, I just did a video about this, actually. Okay. Uh, it is it's brand, brand new. And a lot of it's still brand new to me, too. So I just was still learning about it more myself. But as far, uh, Robert, so as far as I understand, um, at least what I understand there's, there are rules to be, I do think you, because you have, if you do have an LLC, I do think you need to register for it. There, If you go to their um, their website, which is FinCEN, and then you go to, they have like a, a an FAQ section, they, yeah. they have a comprehensive list of, of entities that are exempt. Um, you can look in there to see if your situation would be exempt. Off the top of my head, I, I don't think it is because there's only like, there's like 20 type of entities that are exempt. So I right. do think more, I guess what I'm saying, more likely than not, you would be subject to those rules and probably just need to apply. I think you just do it one time as far as I'm aware of, and then you don't have to worry about it again, unless there's an ownership change or something else. Um, as far yeah. as I'm aware of, there's no fee to do it. It just takes a little bit of time to do. And uh, for anybody who's wondering, there's the video right there. So go check that out on Money and Life TV. Looks like already has uh, 1,500 views. And I think this is the, is this the website here? Beneficial ownership information? Yeah, actually, um, I, I give a, I created a free handout. I actually was lucky enough. I don't know if you call this lucky or bad luck, but I caught the the live webinar from FinCEN on the day it was being broadcasted. And I okay. typed up a ton of notes and I put them into a free handout for people. Yeah, and I think uh, I, I may have missed this, apologies, but I think we had to, if you are an LLC and you have a bank account, I think we, the bank account side of things, we had to also ask you, uh, our customers to provide additional information. I think a month wow. or two ago. So that, you know, it's being run through the standard process. And if they already know you registered as an LLC bank account, I think there were questions we had to answer like as customers of Baselane um, to, to be able to provide the missing information that we had. So yeah, uh, hopefully that helps you. And um, I think may maybe before we go, Mike, what is the best way for people to be able to contact you, to find you and to talk shop about, you know, tax strategies and how to optimize their deductions. Yeah, well, thanks for asking. So the best way to find me or at least, you know, start the conversation is to go to my website, which is www.mikekellycpa.com. And then I have a, an intake form on my website. And if you fill it out, it will then send me an email. And then that's how I, you know, it will in the intake form, you put in your phone number, you know, you kind of like what you're looking for. Um, a lot of people reach out to me through there. They want to be compliance. Um, and some people just want, you know, like consulting. Yeah. I, I'll just tell you right now, if, like, if you're just looking for like one-time consulting, my rates like 165 per hour. Um, but if you're looking for something more like tax prep and long-term strategy building, uh, I do that as well. Awesome. And there was a question earlier, do you do personal and business or is it only business? Uh, both. I do both. I've, um, okay. I was fortunate enough to do virtually do every area of tax since the beginning. So <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I do nonprofits. I do a lots of estates and trust work. Um, a lot of the big real estate investors I've worked with, I was actually working through their estates because they had passed away as one estate I worked on had 30 something rental properties in it. It was massive. <laughs> and I think you mentioned this to me before, because I'm, my stuff uh, is in Philly and New York and all of that. So all, you, you cover all 50 states for tax prep. I do. Yeah. I, I, I have clients in, I think currently I have clients in about 20 different states right now. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. I already have Mike's number. I know I'm going to be reaching out to him because I got to, <laughs> I got to sit down and plan out the next couple of years, but uh, thank you to everybody who attended. Um, I think this was a record um, attendance just for any webinar we've had so far. Hopefully you all found it to be helpful. And, you know, if you have thoughts or comments, we'll send out an email and would love to get some feedback on that. Mike, thank you so much for being here. It was amazing. I learned a lot. I, I, I'm i already thinking about some things I need to do. <laughs> so uh, I think we're going to be chatting soon. And uh, like you said, you can check out Mike's YouTube channel. 
We'll send that out in the email follow-up as well as his website link as well. And uh, if you're new to Baselane or you're learning about Baselane, check out Baselane's website. Um, and I wanted to reshare this because I wanted to make sure that you know we, we can track you back through this. So let me just share this again. If you are signing up as a new first-time Baselane customer, you can go to baselane.com slash MikeCPA. And again, you get a chance to win a $500 Amazon gift card for that too. So hopefully that helps. And uh, we'll see everybody next time. We're coming up with some more webinars for February. So we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for Bye. having me. All right. Bye-bye. Oh.